Hello and welcome to the final installment of Around the Valley, where the points are made up, but the topics are 100% real. I'm your host, Will Weir, and for our returning viewers, you know how it works, but for those of you new to the program, we debate local and national sports topics for your viewing pleasure, and at the end of the show, I will award one of our esteemed guests with the People's Championship and give them their moment of fame in our segment known as Rant Time. First, let's meet our guests. With us today, we have the dashingly stylish rookie phenom from the mean streets of Southie, Ryan England. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome, Will. And next to him, we have a, re a returning guest who is the star of the YouTube sensation Art and part <laughs> owner of the Green Bay Packers, Mr. John Walsh. Thanks for having me back, Will. No problem, John. Love having you here. Guys, a lot to get to. Let's begin with the NBA playoffs mm -hmm. and let's go local. The Celtics, uh, game five. Let's just get right to the end of the game. Rajon Rondo steals the ball, 10 seconds left, no timeouts, ends up trapped in the corner. Celtics lose a heartbreaker, 87 86. What do you take away from game five, John, and where do you see this series going forward? Well, one of our esteemed colleagues last night when I was watching the game, Alex Schofield, mentioned to me during the fourth quarter that Doc was calling a timeout almost after about seven minutes, almost every time we got the ball, we were calling a timeout. He was wondering why we were using them all up. Clearly, we could have used one there with 10 seconds when Rondo got the steal. I think that. He's the best in the league at drawing up plays, Doc Rivers is. Mm -hmm. So coming out of like timeouts and stuff, we always get baskets, so that would have been a perfect time to have a timeout. I wish we had one. As for the game as a whole, though, I think um, Rondo specifically and the team in general just need to be more assertive. You saw the way they started the game, came out strong, took an early lead, and then they got relaxed and let the Hawks back into it. Joe Johnson and Josh Smith were terrible in the first half. I think they had like three baskets between them, and it was a tie game. So... I don't know. I think the team as a whole, coming home, it'll be a lot easier for them, but they need to be more assertive from the start and just throughout the whole game. Yeah, guys, I mean, I was a little disappointed. I mean, this is a team with championship pedigree. I would have liked to have seen that killer instinct to put a te uh, young team down who was down 3-1. I understand they're on their home court. But um, overall, I'm not worried about it. Um, I, the only thing I am worried about is Pierce's knee. Um, I do think that is affecting him, but, you know, coming back to the garden, I'm sure that we'll wrap this up in game six. Uh, something of note that uh, seems to me that I've noticed is late in games, which used to be the calling card of the Celtics, is finishing out a team tight game late. has kind of been something that they've sort of struggled with all year. Seems as though a lot they've gone as their final play call. Ra rather than running a play, they've kind of gone to a pierce isolation at the top where he tries to get that jumper uh, from the elbow. But it's seemingly, maybe it's just me, but it hasn't really been working this year. What can the Celtics do to fix that going forward in the series and hopefully the playoffs? Well, I think the ball needs to be in Rondo's hands and create something. Uh, I've never really been a fan of the PS isolation, um, and especially in the short season where you know there's been groups of two games back to back, three games back to back. He's just not going to get the same lift on those jump shots with a defender in his face. So the ball needs to be in Rondo's hand. He needs to be creating in those final minutes. I think maybe in a tie game, being in Rondo's hand, it'd be fine. But you, if they if it's if we're losing, they can just foul him and take their chances at the free throw line. So I think I, it needs to be in Pierce's hand because he is our go-to and he's great with game winners. But I think maybe either a pick and roll with KG where KG can stick that jump shot. Or if it's a tie game, we can give it to Rondo and run a play for Ray because he gets open whenever he feels like it. So, But generally when, it's a, when we need a basket, I like it in Pierce's hands. All right, well, let's, let's stick in the East and let's head over to a couple of the other series. Uh, first, let's start with the Sixers who had a chance to put away the Noah and Roseless Bulls in Game 5, but the Bulls grinded it out and pulled out what I would definitely call a very ugly victory and not a fun game to watch. But what do the Bulls have enough ammunition to come back in this, most likely without Noah and definitely without Rose? Um, I think Noah's a big question. If he plays, I think it'll be a much tighter game. But um, Turner and Elton Brand were basically useless for Philadelphia last game, so I think if Turner can play the way he has been playing earlier in the series, they should, uh, they should close it out next game. Yeah, of course, it would be great to get Noah back. Hopefully he does come, well, not for the Celtics, but hopefully for the Bulls, he does come back uh, full strength for them. But they are still a defensive-minded team. Obviously, Thibodeau is always uh, focused defensively. So I think as long as they keep the series ugly like the last game was, it may not be pretty to watch, but I think they can come back. Yeah, from a Celtics point of view, you almost would rather play the Bulls without Rose. Obviously, they have mm -hmm. a great defense, but the Sixers match up tough against us, and we play them all, all the time throughout the year. So... I think that would almost be a more dangerous series for the Celtics than the Bulls. Okay, switching over to the Pacers, who actually were the only team uh, the other night to close out their series in Game 5. Uh, what do you guys make of the Pacers' victory over a Dwight Howardless Magic team, and a Magic team that seemingly 
really didn't have any type of flow throughout the series. Hidu Turgulu just completely disappeared. So how much is this really, do you give the pay, like how much momentum can the Pacers build from this victory? Um, I think if you ask anyone who's been watching the playoffs, that was probably the last series that anyone was watching or paying attention to because Miami's going to clear out whichever one of those teams advanced. So unfortunately for the Pacers, they're going to have to walk <laughs> into Miami who should close out their series tonight. And I, th I think it could even be a sweep, whichever team. It was almost like foregone conclusion that Miami is just going to roll over whichever one of those teams advanced. Yeah, I mean, do I expect the Pacers to put up, put up a series against the Heat? Not exactly. Um, I do think if they somehow were able to stay one in Miami and they were able to get you know, a couple games in Indiana, I mean, that's a bas basketball mm -hmm. mecca. I think the momentum could possibly swing a game um, in that series towards the Pacers, but do I expect that to happen? Yeah, no. early, early on in the year, the Pacers were playing great, top four team in the East, and they completely just fell apart towards the end of the year. Not sure exactly what happened, but the team as a whole just doesn't really have a chance against Miami. Okay, before we move on, uh, take a quick look out west uh, where the Thunder, uh, the Thunder and the Spurs swept through their series with relative ease. Uh, the Clips and Grizz have had an interesting series. A lot of tight games, a lot of faltering by the Grizz late in games has really cost them as they trail 3-1. to one. And then uh, in the other series, uh, I can't remember who's in the other series Lakers. right now. Lakers. Thank you. The Lakers and Nuggets. Uh, the Nuggets really have been kind of played by not really having that one star to go to. They've hung around 3-2, have hold off, held off a late barrage from Kobe Bryant uh, in Game 5. Out of those series, do you see either of the teams that are up right now losing? Um, I would say the best chance of losing would be the Clippers. I think the Lakers should have closed their series out last night, and Kobe tried his best to do it. But um, when Bynum only gets eight shots, that's what the Lakers need to stay away from. They can't have Kobe chucking it up 30 times a game. Obviously, he caught fire at the end there, but if Bynum's only getting eight shots in the post, uh, that's going to be a problem for them going forward. Um, in the other series, uh, Memphis has more lost those games than I feel like the Clippers have won them. Obviously, the first game, they blew that 20-something point lead in the first quarter. And then the last couple of games, it's it's more the Clippers falling apart than the, mm -hmm. or the Grizzlies falling apart, excuse me, than the Clippers making a comeback, in my view. Yeah, I mean, I would love to see the Lakers um, blow this, especially after Bynum's foot-and-mouth comment about being easy to close out games and then losing on your home court. Um, but like you alluded to, Denver doesn't have a closer. Um, clo close games in the end, which I think these next two games will come down to if it gets you know, to a seventh game, Kobe's going to take over to make sure the Lakers get to the next round. Um, John is right. The Grizzlies have lost those, those two games more than the Clippers have won them. Um, but unfortunately, I mean, we want Rudy Gay to be a superstar, and he, still, mm -hmm. he hasn't making that, made that jump yet. Uh, so I just really think that Seemingly if he always on the brink. Yeah, right? if if he wants to make that jump, he can't allow that to happen, and that just hasn't happened. So I, I do expect um, the Grizzlies to lose. All right. Well, thank you guys. Now let's head on over to the ice for the other playoffs that are occurring right now, and let's go to the East, uh, where the New York Rangers are up three to two in their series with the Washington Capitals due to a gigantic mental mistake by Joel Ward, who was actually the player who sent the Bruins packing in the previous round. He committed a penalty with under a minute to go, allowing the Rangers to score and then winning the game in overtime, which potentially could set up a Rangers-Devils Eastern Conference Finals as the Devils uh, ended the Philadelphia Flyers season in Game 5. And uh, Ryan, could you just give me some of your thoughts on what a Rangers-Devils almost subway series would, would, uh, would be like? Uh, I can't give you much because it's hockey, but uh, you know, it would be great to see that that matchup in um, you know, the biggest sports market in the country. Um, I wouldn't exactly um, chalk it up as going to happen right now. I mean, the Caps have shown resiliency all throughout the playoffs, obviously beating the Bruins. Um, they've had a num number of close games and overtime games, so it would be great to see um, you know, that big market matchup, but I do expect the Caps to continue to uh, give New York a challenge. And Barry Melrose thinks they're going to Game 7, so you know, love Barry. I'm going with Barry in the mullet. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, real quickly, Rudy Gay is absolutely a superstar. Oh, yeah, and um, like you said, I wouldn't count out the Capitals. I think they could easily win a home game, game six, and then in hockey, especially anything goes in game mm -hmm. seven. But assuming the Rangers do advance, I think the Devils can put up a really strong fight. They're looking uh, really hot, hitting on all cylinders, and Brodeur is playing like he was playing 20 years ago. So I think they would have a really good shot at, <clears throat> at beating the Rangers. Excuse okay. me. Okay. Well, in the Western Conference, uh, the Western Fi Conference Finals matchup is already set between the LA Kings and the Phoenix Coyotes. And of note on the LA Kings is UMass alum, their goalie, Jonathan Quick, having an outstanding postseason. He is currently 8-1 with a 1.55 goals against average. And so what I want to know from the two of you as fellow UMass students, soon-to-be alums, 
What does this mean to see another UMass athlete succeeding on such a big level? Well, it definitely gives some interest out west for us personally. Obviously, we're Bruins fans first and foremost, so mostly Eastern Conference. So not knowing too much about Western Conference hockey, it gives you almost a team to watch and follow. And Quick's playing, he's the best goalie in the league right now, easily. Like you said, his goal against average is uh, very impressive, so it almost gives you a team to root for out west. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just a great story about UMass athletes coming out of coming out of the, uh, the Amherst area and making it big. I mean, overall, we aren't really you know, expected to be powerhouses. You have have a lot of players, you know, in the professional ranks, um, but to you know see John Quick, who's on one of the most dominant eight seeds of all time. I mean, mm -hmm. that's pretty absurd. And Victor Cruz beating all the odds to win, win, a, um, win a Super Bowl. It's just a great story, and obviously, you know, it gives us pride as we're about to graduate as well. Well, sticking with that theme of uh, UMass sports, currently on campus, the UMass men's lacrosse team and women's lacrosse team will enter the NCAA tournament this weekend. The men will play host to Colgate here on UMass campus on Saturday at 2.30, while the women will travel to Maryland. And right now we have ATV Zone Ted Barry, who got a chance to sit down with some of the members of the UMass men's lacrosse team. Will, I'm joined here today by two members of the Minutemen lacrosse team, Colin Fleming, a junior midfielder from Philadelphia, and Jake Smith, a junior defenseman from Medfield, Massachusetts. They're both integral parts of their team's success this year, as Colin is fourth in the team in goals and total points, and Jake has started every game in defense this year, and is a force causing turnovers and uh, getting up to ground balls. Colin, can you tell us a little bit about what has been the driving forces behind the success of your team this year? Well, we try to take each game and look at it as a big game and a season of big games, so we don't take anyone for granted, and we sort of approach each game the exact same way, and I think that has led a lot to our success. We, uh, our seniors have been great, and they keep us, keep us in check. We have weekly meetings with our team without the coaches and it's a great way to sort of start the week and keep your goals in line and that's another main thing is concentrating on the goals and we've only reached a couple of them we have a couple more to reach so hopefully we get those. I think you guys are doing a pretty good job this season uh, kind of seems like everything's really f coming together you know you have one of the best goalies in the country uh, you have a great balanced attack um, offense you know passing the ball around um, Jake, can you talk a little bit about the defense and what it's mean? You guys have the th uh, third-ranked scoring defense in the country right now. How has the defense kind of held down for you guys, uh, you know, picked up the offense at times? Yeah, um, I mean, this year it's actually been mostly about keeping it pretty simple. We, uh, we haven't tried to overcomplicate things too much, and just being a pretty experienced group, it's just been good working with all the seniors and uh, just being able to communicate with them, being on the same page. Um, so what has it meant for you guys, you know, uh, UMass has come off a few, not necessarily disappointing seasons, but, you know, this will be your first time in the tournament since 2009. Um, by, you know, far and away the best record you guys have had. First undefeated season since 1969. What does it mean to know that this kind of success has come on the heels of that? Did you guys kind of expect this um, before the season, Colin? Well, uh, last year we knew, we were very disappointed when we lost in the championship. We kind of have a chip on our shoulder and we still do from that mm -hmm. and uh, we concentrated a lot on the fall and like I said earlier the seniors had sort of took us by the reins and changed around a couple things team rules this and that and we we really bonded and we're all we're not just like teammates we're pretty much all best friends and we don't want to we don't want to lose because then we have to say goodbye to the seniors so we're really trying to we say that we have a saying, self-preservation. So, trying to stay together as long as we can. So the chemistry's there too. Chemistry's yeah. kind of behind all this. You know, it's great season. Um, you guys have played some fantastic teams this year. You know, really great teams, some great wins. But of course, as you know, only the best of the best make it to the tournament. Um, Jake, what does it mean for you guys to know you have to play? You know, uh, further rounds of the tournament. In the next two rounds alone, you potentially have to play perennial powerhouses like Duke, Maryland, uh, Hopkins, Syracuse. What adjustments might you have to make to play teams like this, or you know, if any at all? Yeah, um, I mean, we've had a lot of big games this year, so we're just taking it one step at a time. Uh, we really don't want to change the way we prepare. We think with the players we have and uh, with how we've been playing so far, if we just keep it up, keep preparing the right way, just keep mm -hmm. working hard throughout the, uh, throughout the practice week, we'll be fine against pretty much anyone we play. All right, great. Um, so the first round of the playoffs is this Saturday. You guys host Colgate. Um, both of you, what can we kind of expect out of this game? Um, 
more of the same from the rest of the season? Or, you know, how are you guys feeling about this game? Feeling pretty good. I mean, playing back on Garber Field, so mm -hmm. I'm going to be playing hard, fast, and uh, take it to Colgate. All right. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I couldn't be more excited. They're the number one offense in the country, I think, right now. So good just having the opportunity, guys. yeah, it's awesome. All right. Um, so looking forward to that game, but also at the same time, you know, the girls across team is having a pretty fantastic season of their own. They also play in the first round of their tournament, the same, guy, same time as you guys, 2 o'clock on Saturday. Um, what does it mean to have them kind of paralleling you guys? You guys are making great runs at the same time, just to have this great school spirit, you know, the students are ending the school year, but kind of getting behind both of you guys. How has that affected you guys and your preparations as well? It's pretty cool. They're the girls are some of our best friends. We lived with them for the last two years, and it's uh, awesome to see them succeed because they work just as hard as we do. So, and it's pretty cool to see the two lacrosse teams at UMass succeeding at the same time. So we're pumped for them. They got a tough one with Maryland, but I think they'll get put up a fight and uh, hopefully take it to them. Yeah, I agree. It's been uh, unfortunately we haven't been able to uh, go to too many other games. Our mm -hmm. schedules kind of conflict, but. It's awesome when we can, and it's awesome having them just come to support us. All right. We'll be looking forward to both of those games this weekend. Guys, I just want to congratulate you guys on the great season, and good luck to the tournament. Thank you. Appreciate you guys stopping by today, and I'll take it back to you now, Will. All right. Thank you, Ted. And we wish them the best of luck in their match. Uh, sticking with the spring theme now, we're going to head on over to the Red Sox, and let's talk a little baseball. Right now, Red Sox still completely and utterly a disaster and a mess. 12 and 17, last place in the AL East, coming off a homestand against the Oakland A's and Baltimore Orioles last week, in which they lost five of six games. Currently, four and ten at home. And Ryan, I want to head to head to you for your expertise. What can you give us about this Red Sox team? What are we to make of them at this point right now? They slimmed simply down to the pitching. It, it all comes down to pitching. I mean, I know. Uh, Gonzalez right now isn't exactly swinging the bat like he was last year, though I think he is due to turn that around. Um, obviously, we're dealing with the injuries as well, but the pitches, especially the starting pitches, they've barely been able to get out of the fifth, even the fourth inning. Clay Buckholtz was just a mess, you know, a few games ago. Um, so when we're already, get, already getting into a bullpen that doesn't have the depth, it, it just spells for disaster. And as long as the injuries and the pitching um, isn't there, we're just going to be in trouble. Yeah, I think you're right, especially with the starting pitching when, when Dubronx may be your best starting pitcher right now with uh, mm -hmm. Lester and Beckett and Buckholz up there, you're, you're going to have a problem. Like you said, the hitting is an issue. Um, I think also the fans just have a lot to complain about right now. They're getting starting to get on Uke's back, especially with the way Middlebrooks mm -hmm. is playing. Um, so I don't know, if they don't turn it around soon, you've been through the rotation many times now, so if they don't start to turn it around, these fans are really going to turn on the team. Obviously the pitching is a problem, but you guys brought up two specific players which I'd like to talk about. First, let's start with Adrian Gonzalez. As you mentioned, not off to a great start, hitting 280 with two homers, 16 RBIs, and a whopping 24 strikeouts. Uh, you know, his season was really highlighted in that 17-inning marathon affair uh, against the Baltimore Orioles this past Sunday, where he went 0 for 8, including a strikeout in the 17th against DH first baseman Chris Davis of the Baltimore Orioles. Repeat, DH first baseman Chris Davis of the Baltimore Orioles. And so my question is, what is, what is going on with Adrian right now? And also, after the game, he was refusing to talk with the media, which is something in this town, win, lose, or tie, you got to talk to the media in this town. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, it is very easy to make that game to, you know, make it into a microcosm of Adrian Gonzalez's season, you know, going 0 for 8, three strikeouts. Um, but overall, I mean, he's still hitting fly balls at the same rate he was last year. I mean, 280, yeah, it's not the same he was hitting last year, but that's still relatively a good average. I expect, you know, that to go up as the season progresses. Um, I am a little worried about the power. It hasn't really been there, but like I said, since the fly balls are up, I do expect him to start hitting it out of the park. Um, overall, though, it seems like it could be turning into the type of marriage where he's just not the type of player who thrives in Boston, you know, he's quiet. J.D. Uh, he, Drew S. doesn't it, quite fit the and mold. And it's funny you bring J.D. Drew up. I mean, that at bat against Chris Davis, that was a J.D. Drew matting at bat. And I'm a <laughs> J.D. Drew fan, but that was a typical three pitches by and see you later. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Adrian Gonzalez, he, you know, he used to play in the, you know, very laid back San Diego market. I just don't think Boston is exactly, you know, the type of pressure cooker that he, you know, is comfortable in. Hopefully I'm wrong. I mean, obviously we paid him all that money and he has a hell of a talent. So he does have the chance to turn it around, but it is a little bit worrisome. Yeah, it's like you said, playing in Boston is way different than playing almost anywhere else in the MLB. Um, so maybe it is a mental thing. Maybe he's just struggling 
because he's not hitting the home runs that he's looking for get, but hopefully he can just overcome that and mentally see, we'll see how strong he is, and if not, then maybe it will be a Dre Drew situation where you have to try and move him. Well, John, you brought up another name earlier that I wanted to get to, which is Will Middlebrooks, uh, the rookie third baseman who has come up from Pawtucket and has been scorching hot. 409 average, three homers, nine RBIs. Now, uh, now obviously, it's a very small sample size, but we had the controversy between Bobby V and Uke earlier in the season. <clears throat> Uke on the DL right now. So, John, what are your impressions, first of all, of Middlebrooks in the little sample you've seen, who is also having an amazing start in Pawtucket, 333, nine homers, 27 ribbies in his extended time down there. And do you see trouble brewing upon Kevin Euclid's return? Uh, well, it's like you said, small sample size, so we'll see going forward. But obviously, you, you can't not be impressed with the way he's playing. He's crushing the ball right now. He's probably one of the best hitters we have going right now, which is tough to say. And then you brought up the Euclid Valentin thing. We'll see what happens when Euclid, if Euclid comes back anytime soon. Uh, rumors of him moving to the outfield, Middlebrooks, but um, those are just rumors right now, so we'll see how far it goes. And then it also depends when and if Euclid comes back anytime soon. Yeah, honestly, I see this as a great thing. I mean, it, uh, Euclid's fiery attitude, his competitiveness, it's well documented. Um, I can only see this lighting a fire under him, hopefully turning around you know, his season that has been hampered by injuries. Uh, but I'm excited about it. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to see Will Middlebrooks live last year in a re rehab start in Lowell. Uh, he did home Inside run information inside here on Around the Valley. Right there. He, uh, he is, I know they do think very highly of him, and he is a uh, third baseman of the future, but hopefully this can only uh, you know, push you as he gets those uh, last years out of, his, uh, out of his career. Well, definitely a developing situation that we'll keep our eye on, but sticking with the theme of rookies, let's head over to the National League where rookie phenom Bryce Harper was involved in an incident earlier this week with Cole Hamels, in which Cole Hamels beamed Bryce Harper in, the, in his back in the first pitch of his at-bat Sunday night to send a message, which he later admitted to post-game and since has been suspended for five games. Ryan, let's just first get to this incident. Before you get to that sip of water, I know that's, you're parched. That's fine. But was this move by Hamels, was it old school baseball, welcome to the big leagues, or completely Bush League? Welcome to the big leagues. Absolutely, absolutely loved it. Uh, hitters these days, um, you see them with the gigantic elbow pads, they got shin pads on, far too comfortable at the plate. Um, pitchers do need to assert themselves and take back that inner pot. Um, Bryce Hoppe is you know, a great story for the league. I love how he's already come out and is basically already living up to those expectations. Um, I don't think this is, he actually didn't have a problem with him himself. He you know, uh, kind of just dusted off a question about it. But I'm, I'm absolutely, um, absolutely all for it. And Cole Hamels didn't hide. He, he said he did it on purpose. He's also a National League pitcher. He knew that he was going to get into the batter's box. He was hit as well, had no problem with that. He understands that the pro that's the protocol. So I think that was an absolutely fine move, and I think Bryce Hopp is going to think twice you know, next time he uh, digs in at the plate. Yeah, I think the league and the media made a much bigger deal about it than Hamels or Harper will ever care much about it. You know, I think I believe he stole home after he got yeah. hit there. So he clearly got his own revenge. Yeah, yeah, he, he, got, got, his, he got his revenge while he was on, on base there. As so, Hamels says, that's how it should be. Yeah, I don't think it's a big deal. I think it's useless. I don't think... I, like, like you said, he might think twice. I don't think he's going to care next time he steps up to the plate. You know, he had to do it three or four more times that game. So I think pegging him's not going to change the way he attacks pitching or anything like that. But like you said, old school baseball, yeah. it is what it is. And the thing was, Hamels did it right. He didn't do chin music. He didn't go high. Mm -hmm. He, you know, he should have been a little lower. I will give him that. If he had put it in the ass rather than yeah. the back, that would have been better. But it was still, you know, in a fairly safe place to do it. Now let's just talk specifically about Bryce Hopper for a minute. He is 19 years old, one of the youngest players to ever play in the major leagues. He's been on Sports Illustrated and been on everybody's radar for the last couple of years. He's batting third on the NL's best team record-wise, hitting 308, and has a cannon of an arm, plays great defense. Uh, Ryan, what do, you, what do you see that impresses you, and what do you see that he can improve upon as such a young player? Uh, honestly, the maturity. I mean, we've heard a lot about his maturity issues kind of in the minors, but I think people do forget how young he is. But he's come out to the major leagues and already is approaching the game like, you know, seasoned hitter. He's not up there swinging away all the time. You know, he, uh, he's getting on base. He took a walk in like a second at bat. I mean, there's not many rookies who will, you know, sit back in the second at bat in the major leagues and just walk to first base. So he's really been great at the plate, has a seasoned approach. And um, I think this might be one of those rare instances where someone actually matches the hype. Yeah, as a young kid, it's got to be <clears throat> it's got to be really hard to step in and have, be on Sports Center every day. You're every at bat, every time the balls hit to you, you're on TV, you're getting watched. But he's living up to it right now. Like you said, that throw is like mm -hmm. that he threw from the outfield, just a laser beam to the home plate. Uh, it gets everyone excited, gives something to watch. People that wouldn't be fans of the Nationals or anything like that get a 
get a close view and something to get excited about. Yeah, and having you know having this you know superstar in our nation's capital for you know America's pastime, it's just a great story. Yeah, him and Strasburg could get people really excited about that team. Nationals definitely a team on the rise, and one thing I will say about Harper is that I would not mind seeing his haircut end up in the garbage can. Speaking of which, we're gonna head on over to our weekly segment, the garbage can with the beautiful Mark McDonough. Welcome to the final installment of The Garbage Can with beautiful Mark McDonough. The Associated Press has described the segment as Satan's playground. Okay, they didn't say that. But this last one is going to be no holds barred. The entrants into this week's Garbage Can have no rhyme or reason, and many of them are not even from this decade. But I, I need to make up for lost time. Mariana Rivera, you're on The Garbage Can. You ruined your, se your season, and potentially the New York Yankees season, because you blew out your knee flagging down fly balls in the outfield before the game. As someone who used to literally, pr pr uh, pr it's the last one. As someone who used to literally pray the ball wasn't hit to me, I can't imagine someone doing that for fun. Never mind a millionaire. Smooth move, Mariano. Spike Lee, you're in the garbage can. You wore an Amish suit with a four-foot-long red tie to the Knicks game last week. You're a 50-plus-year-old man. Stopped acting like a f***ing idiot. I wish Reggie Miller had done the right thing and had banned you from courtside forever. New Orleans Saints, you're in the garbage can. You guys are all a bunch of fart-faced bullies. But you're not in the garbage can for the bounty program. In ancient Sparta, you were punished for stealing. You weren't punished. You weren't punished for stealing. You were punished for being caught. This is Spartan rules, and you're in the garbage can for getting caught. Kemba Walker, Corey Maggette, Gerald Henderson, DJ Augustin, and whoever the heck else is on the Charlotte Bobcats, you're in the garbage can. You are historically one of the worst teams ever assembled. I think a group of actual Bobcats would be better at basketball. Ricky Davis, you're in the garbage can. You once missed a shot on purpose so you get the rebound and attain a triple-double. I know that was like seven years ago, but it was just absolutely ridiculous. The 1972 Miami Dolphins, you're in the garbage can. You're still bragging about your perfect season from 50 years ago and actively rooting against current teams. What an obnoxious group of soul winners. Mercury Morris, you're an old man. Take your medicine and go to bed. John Walsh, you're in the garbage can. How do you appear on almost every episode of Around the, Volley, Around the Valley and never actually win? Vince McMahon, you're in the garbage can. You let The Rock beat John Cena at WrestleMania. Please tell me the purpose of having your top guy lose. I like The Rock. The jabroni beating, la 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 la, pie eating, trail blazing, eyebrow raising, best in the future, best in the past. If you don't like it, you can kiss the peoples just as much as the rest of them. But it was a bad business move to have him beat Cena. To that guy in the Pittsburgh Steelers that called Tom, Tom Brady out that time, I can't remember your name, but you're in the garbage can. Tom Brady's still kicking butt and you're most likely stocking shelves at Target. Mark McDonough, for almost never being prepared, I'm in the garbage can. To Teddy and Will and the people at Amherst TD, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you all for watching. Now one more time. End it! End it or I will! All right, thank you, Mark, for your always unique and personal take on the world of sports, now and in the, and in the past. And guys, unfortunately, we have come to the conclusion of the final episode of Around the Valley. And it is time for me to award the final People's Championship belt. And I am proud to say that for the first time in Around the Valley history, today's People's Champ is me. That's right. I'm sick and tired of these jabronis over here coming in and taking my People's Championship, using up my rant time, and I'm not having it anymore. The belt shall forever remain with the founding fathers of Around the Valley. Now, having said that, I'd like to take this time to thank everybody who's been a part of this show, from Jim to Candace to Kayla to all the interns who have made this show possible for Ted and I, as well as our esteemed panel of guests who have been nothing but the best. And to all you viewers out there, thank you for constantly tuning in and watching our show. And for those of you out there who don't believe us, believe me, everyone that has been involved in this show, it is only the beginning and not the end. And if you, and if you think twice about it, just remember, you come at the king, you best not miss. So for the last time on the only show that always goes from ashy to classy, this has been Around the Valley. Thank you for joining us. Never gonna get it, John. <laughs>